All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. So I'm from Canada, and our basketball <laughs> oh, team, nah. the Toronto Raptors, just won the NBA Finals. So this has inspired me to get back into playing basketball. So shoes I'm not going to wear include flip-flops and high heels because, frankly, I don't want to break my neck. And this is akin to the era of using plain old balloon angioplasty in coronary intervention. We may still use it in certain clinical scenarios, but we certainly have better platforms than that nowadays. So what about these nice uh, street kicks here for about $50? Well, I can get through a game of basketball with these. I might roll my ankle. I might suffer some injuries, but I can get the job done. This is similar to using bare metal stents for procedures and maybe our very first generation drug eluting stents. Again, we know that we do have superior uh, platforms at our disposal. So how about these nice ASICS runners here that I can get for about $70? Well, these are great. I can run in these. They're comfortable. I don't anticipate any in injuries. I'm not looking for anything much better than that. And that's akin to our um, contemporary cohort of second generation drug eluting stents. What more could I really ask for? But wait, you tell me, what I really want are these $5,000 Nike Pro Tro limited edition purple <laughs> sneakers. I'm going to be a better player with these, right? And this is sort of akin to our ultra-thin stents that we have in our bioabsorbable polymers. These are going to be better, right? Well, at what point does it become less about the shoes that I'm putting on my feet and more about the fact that I haven't played you know, basketball since I was on the junior high school team? What you really need is a guy like this, a skilled precision operator who's going to perform careful PCI. And when does it become more about the game or the patient milia and other factors as well? So you are going to tell me, of course, that drug eluting stents have different properties. And I can't argue with that. But the question is, what meaningful difference does it actually make? What about for the operator? Well, you could say that some of us are waiting to be wowed. Some of the promised differences between these stents, well, better visibility, perhaps. I haven't yet struggled to see a single stent. Deliverability, well, you need a basic amount, but among contemporary platforms, the differences seem quite subtle. And I have tools like guide extensions and inchworming, et cetera, that are probably going to make a much bigger difference for me in stent delivery. Radial strength, when was the last time you exclaimed during a procedure, wow, I'm amazed at the, at the lack of recoil of that drug eluting stent, and I chose it because of that. It just doesn't really happen. So what about for the patient? Well, contemporary drug eluting stents have clinical rates of uh, instant rate stenosis of approximately 5%. It doesn't mean that the patients are dying. They may be having chest pain and coming back for a repeat angiogram and intervention. But stent thrombosis, well, that could be important for patients. But the incidence is about uh, less than 1% per year and less than half a percent per additional year. It's difficult to improve upon that. So if, in fact, event rates are so low, then are we perhaps hitting a wall with minor tweaking of drug eluting stents as we now know them? In many head-to-head -head comparison trials, for instance, our uh, reported bleeding risk is actually higher than the reported CV event rates. With that in mind, this leads me to discussing the trade-offs between pre-market stent assessment and the pace of innovation. So most of these studies have non-inferiority trial designs, and they use composite clinical endpoints. And this style of trial evolved again in an era when we had much higher event rates back when we were doing POPA and using bare metal stents. There's been significant observed declines in the event rates of these combined endpoints. Many of these trials have large non-inferiority margins. There's noise, for instance, from previously stented segments. And all these factors aff affect the chances of obtaining a non-inferiority result. So we end up with a lot of these head-to-head uh, head drug eluting stent trials with these low combined event rates making potentially limited non-inferiority conclusions. Even if the conclusions are correct, non-inferiority does not infer superiority. So this all just supports my argument. I get to say that drug eluting stents are all the same because comparator drug eluting stent B is no worse than comparator drug eluting stent A at the end of the day with these trials. Just an example, um, the 20 trial from 2012, again, you see a composite endpoint here, uh, cardiac death, MI that you couldn't attribute to a non-target vessel and target vessel revask. This study uh, compared compared Resolute ZES to the Zions V platform, almost identical event rates and no significant differences in stent thrombosis. And this has been the story for most of these studies. So with that in mind, what about refocusing our efforts? Just some food for thought. So again, about 36% of patients leave the hospital with no statin prescription after they've had a heart attack. About 1 in 10 patients becomes non-compliant with their DAPT at their significant peril for, for increased MACE and spontaneous MI. Cardiac rehab, we know, can actually decrease all-cause mortality up to about 30%, but yet we only send up to as much as a third of our patients to that. We know that IVIS, or intracoronary imaging over angiographic satisfaction, significantly reduces our target vessel failure and improves MACE. Um, 
the defined PCI study shows us that many of our patients, up to 24%, leave the cath lab with residual significant ischemia, most of which are focal lesions that could be uh, theoretically treated. But wait. What about the differences in polymer durability and stent strut thickness? Maybe this is going to make the major difference for patients. Well, enter the Challenger stent, the bioabsorbable polymer or ultra-thin strut, 60 micron, particularly this Orsero stent, although there's others. So Orsero has been looked at in actually about a dozen worldwide clinical programs, so surely I'm going to be able to tell you that it's better, right? Well, I won't bore you with going through all of these studies, but I went through all of them out of interest. So BioFlow 1 to BioFlow 4, first of all, all I can tell you is that in comparison to other platforms, essentially you're getting safety signals or non-inferiority claims for things like late lumen loss and target uh, vessel failure. Now, I do have to mention BioFlow 5, which did show significantly lower TLF with Orsero compared to the Zions platform. However, most of that difference occurred within the first year, which does raise a question, could there be other periprocedural factors at play? Um, BioFlow 6, again, we're back to saying non-inferiority for late lumen loss. The BioResort trial raised some interest because um, it was comparing Orsero and Synergy versus Resolute Integrity. Again, non-inferiority was obtained at one year and at two to three years for target vessel failure as well. But if you do some statistical mumbo-jumbo and you make this secondary composite endpoint that they made cardiac death, MI, or clinically driven TLR, that outcome was lower in Orsero compared to Resolute, not compared to the Synergy platform, and rates of stent thrombosis were less than 1% and no different between those stents. The sort-out study suggested non-inferiority um, with biolimus eluding stents, although there's some limitations from those studies. And again, Orient non-inferior to resolute integrity for Acero. Same story through Bioscience, Bionics, and Biostemi is the only pending superiority trial which is just com completed enrollment, so I can't tell you about that. So to summarize those bio studies, essentially, BioFlow 5 again creates some interest, but the chance that a single study shows an unexpected result that may be non-reproducible is not negligible, and thus we should be careful about claiming superiority. For bioresort, remember the only difference observed was in a composite secondary endpoint. So generally, the outcomes for these newer technologies have been at best non-inferior to other platforms. Lastly, I'll just point to some clues from the similar effect of uh, drug eluding stent performance in recent alternative DAPT trials across Stop DAPT 2, Smart Choice, and Glassy. When you basically take a melding pot of all of our nice second generation and in some cases third generation um, bioabsorbable polymer stents, you see excellent performance with low event rates, regardless of what you did with DAPT, whether you cut it down to one month, three months, or you switched from DAPT to ticagrelor monotherapy. Excellent outcomes with all of these stent platforms and in fact, in some cases, better with shorter duration, or potentially better with shorter duration DAPTI. So at the end of the day, all contemporary drug eluting stents are just the same. Maybe emerging data will change this, maybe not. Maybe incredible innovations will change this, but we should not fail to devote efforts to simple practices and incrementally impact outcomes over the tweaking of already great stents. Thank you.